everyone. Um, welcome to our third session, mentoring session and professional development session for young makers. We're here today to talk about managing supplies, which is, yay, one of my favorite topics. I think Steve's as well. Um, and so we have a small group today, um, but I think it'll be a hearty, fruitful conversation. Uh, so we'll get started. If we could just go around briefly and introduce ourselves, that would be great. I'm Steve Davey. I'm the Director of Education and Communications at, here at MakerEd. Um, primarily responsible for um, running the program, programmatically wise, MakerCore program, but there's a lot of overlap between the kind of things we want our MakerCore members to know um, when they work across the nation and different youth serving organizations about tools and materials in particular. So it's a, something that we all work with in a whole bunch of settings. So we got a lot to learn from each other. So awesome. looking forward to talking about it. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Michelle? Uh, my name is Michelle Hlubinka, and I am the uh, Director of Custom Programs for Maker Media. Um, I do a lot of different kinds of projects, um, all, mostly related to kids, families, schools. Um, so do a lot around workshop design um, and have over the past couple of decades, I guess. Um, so I'm eager for this conversation. Yay! And Michelle is one of the founding team members of Young Makers. Yeah, sorry, yeah. For Young Makers, um, I was one of the, the team of, um, there were a few of us who started Young Makers back in 2010 or so. Awesome. Well, let's get started. We'll just have a whole bunch of conversations, and I'll ask a bunch of questions and chime in as we go. So um, often a big question that we get asked for Young Makers specifically, but in general with any uh, program related to making or maker curriculum is how we get started and what sorts of tools and supplies to begin with. So I will open that up. Um, what are some good tools and materials to start with to start making? Well, I always like to say it's what you have already. I mean, it's just, it, rather than being caught up in what you need to do to get started, um, I love the idea of looking around to see what you already have um, and getting the children involved in that the scavenger hunt element of it. Um, it's really powerful because all of a sudden it's not, oh, no, we can't do this until we have this. It's, oh, we do have this, and what possibly could we use it for? So there's this tinkering mindset that yeah. I love to engender. Um, so that's my first suggestion. Awesome. Michelle, what about you? Yeah, I, um, I also like to think about um, starting with familiar materials and um, introducing a few not so familiar materials. So one of my favorite things about um, this uh, event that we had at MIT that was sort of a precursor to Maker Faire it was called Mindfest. And um, Karen and Mike, who um, are some of the other co-founders of Young Makers, uh, they were really insistent that all of the electronics kind of supplies were mixed right in there with the craft supplies. So a really rich table where you could um, see all of the materials immediately and um, where the pom-poms were right next to the LEDs. Like, they, they really are very similar. They're decorative and shiny and fun. Um, and so you want kids to be thinking of them in that same way, um, even though the, the way that you activate them is pretty different. It really is kind of funny that children don't see this distinction between art materials and electronic materials. They mm -hmm. see them all as tools, as, as, as different ways of, of languages of expressing their creativity. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, it's real nice to kind of consider that blend. That's great. Yeah, I love both of your answers too, especially because um, I used to do activities with kids that would take common materials that they were already familiar with and try and think of other ways to use them mm -hmm. that might not be traditional ways in which they've typically used them. So that goes a lot to creating new ideas and brainstorming on projects and things, and especially oriented towards materials. Yeah. We've all done a lot with um, yeah. scrap materials. I, I love making the point that, um, unfortunately, people get fired up about STEM stuff in particular, or motors, and they go to a science museum, and more often than not, they encounter this sort of problem. They go to a store, they see this motor right here, and they see an incredible markup of $6 per little motor, and they think that's what these things cost. Um, so the, beyond having what you already have around, you can actually right from the very start enlist the kids in building up your, your toolbox of, of materials by starting with taking things apart. That's just a very classic thing to have around. It's like, what can you take apart? What can you do with the materials? The best quality motors actually come out of things like old toys. And of course kids love that. And they're going to learn something about how these things work as they're taking them apart. So this this whole idea of this whole entire world of things to be recycled and reused that are already in existence that can be repurposed is another fantastic way of just starting out. 
you could have. <laughs> you know, some people are really uh, afraid of taking things apart because they've heard that there there are dangers that are posed. So of course, never Absolutely. never take apart anything that's plugged in or <laughs> still has the batteries in it. Um, but there are some particular things that can, uh, that still carry the charge with the um, capacitors, right, in the microwaves. And there, yes. we have a list that I saw on a windowsill in the Maker Ed offices one day. Yeah. Um, do you know some of those offhand, Steve? For yes, um, no TVs that are of the, the CRT kind, the cathode ray tube. Um, no, no microwaves, uh, no large mm -hmm. appliances. Um, and in the older electronics, in particular the older printers, you want to stick with the inkjet printers rather than the toner printers. If you've got a choice between going between a laser printer, um, toner itself can be very hazardous. It can, in fact, be not to scare you, but it can be carcinogenic. Um, and oftentimes, very old printers that are laser printers have that toner all within and inside. It's part of the reason they go bad as the toner itself gets on all the components, it gets in the mirrors. Um, it's a real shame because some of the old copy machines are fantastically packed full of amazing parts. So I've gone as far as to actually pre-open up a copy machine and vacuum it out extensively before repackaging it together to be taken apart by either adults for professional development or children. But I want to make sure that toner is not around. Now you can remove the toner cartridges, things like that. Um, and then there's the issue of lead. And that's just a common sense issue of like knowing when to like wash your hands or if you're really concerned about things wearing gloves. Uh, most of the modern electronics have to, by law, not have lead in them. The, the Rojas um, standard that's been around for over a decade now uh, makes it so that most toys, even those that are available in goodwill, are compliant with no longer having lead inside them. But the very oldest of toys, the electromechanical ones, that have very big, chunky circuit boards and through-hole electronic parts, that's all going to be lead. Um, mm -hmm. Just so you know that it's not going to kill you to have it there and that you want to wash your hands and not have food on the table, things you're taking apart. Um, we like to have a dust buster around when we're taking things apart. Mm -hmm. You never know when an old printer's got a whole rat's nest inside of it. Yeah. <laughs> so. We also like to have a little magnetic tray to hold some of those little components that oh, might stray away. absolutely. And totally yeah. to go back and identify what they are and how they were used before. That's a fun way to do things as well. So both of you guys mentioned um, reusing and recycling. Where can we find those things? If, if they're not already lying around our house, what are some good sources for finding recycled materials or things to take part? I'll put in a plug for one of my, my favorite sources, and then oh. I know Michelle's got a lot to say about this. <laughs> really quickly, um, I love to advocate for the use of natural materials, especially cool. mixing those in with the non-traditional materials. I mean, there's just something about going outside and gathering leaves and sticks, um, stuff like that. You can sew. You can sew leaves. I mean, actually, many will take thread. Um, they can be woven. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that can be outside with just outside materials. And then I've got a lot more to say, but I want Michelle to go. <laughs> Well, I'm a big fan of cardboard, and um, we save all of our cereal boxes at home. And then um, for larger pieces of cardboard, of course, there's a nonstop influx of stuff that we get shipped to us. But for big pieces, the place to go, people always say appliance uh, appliance stores. But we have, a, um, it's called Cook's Collision around the corner from where we live. Um, it's a like a body shop for people who've had accidents with their cars. And these pieces of cardboard are ginormous. They're bigger yeah. than anything you'll see at a bike store or anything. Like, they are so, yeah, I know, Steve, that you like bike stores. But, yeah, <laughs> they, 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 like, they have to get whole, like, doors or whole, like, bags yeah, yeah. into these boxes. And so they're, like, you know, five feet by eight feet by three feet. And it's it's a struggle then to get it anywhere, but that's we've used a lot of large boxes from the uh, body shop. That's awesome. I never considered body shops. Body this shops is something are great. I, that's what I love about this. So you can go as far as you can in, in decades of gathering materials and still learn new sources and new ways. And so um, cardboard, like, yes. Yeah, we saw it, like they they put them on the side all the time, and they're happy to share them. Awesome. Bike shops are really good too, and Absolutely. I would say appliance stores, especially those refrigerator boxes, well, are pretty phenomenal. Bike shops are also a source not just for cardboard, but they're a source for little plastic bits that are very interesting. Mm -hmm. A lot of all the bikes get packed in boxes, and then when they're unpacked, there's all sorts of doodads and bits and bobs that are designed to protect the bike mm -hmm. that are normally just kind of cast aside or um, sometimes saved to be able to repack bikes. But um, when I was running tinkering workshops and summer camps and after school programs and tinkering, I would I had a whole route of um, bike shops that I would hit that were saving parts for me because these parts were so useful. Uh, they had so many ways of um, serendipitously fitting together. 
uh, when you get a large uh, collection of, of scrap materials, you start to find ways of the parts fit together in ways you didn't imagine because kids are being invited to do that. Awesome. So. I like it. I think another yeah. point to make about that is that it's oftentimes very useful to have a large amount of something. Um, you don't have to have a huge amount of variety, but children will go wild with a large amount of anything yeah. um, because there's something about that constraint of yeah. unlimited amounts, limited choices. I just love that whole creative constraint of that. So I like that. So for that, um, we also religiously save all of the um, caps for any um, milk carton or um, both the square ones and the plastic ones. Mm -hmm. And so we now have, I think, probably 500 plastic caps, which we can use either as wheels or some other um, mechanical part. But also, um, my friend John Gallinato, um, build it yourself in Cambridge Mass uses them as eyes, like he'll use the white yeah. ones and black ones together, or b you can put black beams inside, so instead of getting oh, nice. <laughs> the eyes, those are a really nice way to add character to your... I think that's a really good point. You don't yeah. need to get googly eyes, or you don't need to have sticker detail eyes. Um, children naturally want to anthropomorphize what they're making, and they will, given the opportunity to find circle things, they'll make their own eyes out of anything. Totally. And all of a sudden, anything gets built into a character, and all of a sudden, you don't have just a making experience. You've got a story that's being told with a character, with life, and, and ball cap eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I think one, one area to consider when I'm gathering materials, um, I don't know what's going to happen to them. I love the potential of them, but I do like to keep them kind of... Uh, organized in three general areas um, for the scrap materials. I like to keep the wood materials and the metal materials and the plastic materials somewhat segregated. When I put them out, um, you know, they're, they're kind of mixed together, but when I store them, I, I absolutely categorize things in those areas. And then I have electronics kind of separately. Uh, that just keeps me sane to know where I need what I'm lacking in. Um, do I have too much metal? Do I have not enough plastic? Uh, no, and the kids kind of get used to that too, and so the, at the end of the day when they're helping me put this stuff away, because we haven't talked about management yet, but you got to get the kids involved, um, they say, oh, this is a plastic, boom, there's a place for plastic. And that way you don't get this huge hodgepodge of things. And in the end, if they're looking for something, they, got, they start to understand the affordances of what's possible with plastic versus wood yeah. versus the metal, and they'll go to an area more efficiently understanding what they think they're looking for might be a plastic part. Cool. Exactly. Definitely. And on the paper side of things, Michelle was mentioning how she religiously saves cardboard and plastic caps, which is awesome. Similarly, a lot of people save toilet paper tubes and paper towel tubes, and those are phenomenal things to be used for any sort of project or prototyping. Um, a lot of other good places to look are um, thrift shops for toys that you can take apart. Um, you can also call up your local electronics recycling center, and usually they're absolutely <laughs> delighted to have you come and dig through their bin of extra keyboards and mice, um, and are more than happy to give them away. Um, and they also have a really good understanding of what is, is and isn't safe for you to kind of dig through and play with. Um, one other resource that I have found to be incredible is um, a teacher resource area. And there's a lot of organizations that do just that. They gather together supply, excess supplies from corporations and companies oh, yeah. and other places that have extras, essentially. And they bring it together into some sort of warehouse or space and give access to teachers to buy it or get mm -hmm. it for free. Um, in the Bay Area, there's some place called RAFT, which is called Resource Area for Teachers, and there's locations all over the nation where those yeah. are great places to start. It's Oakland on Telegraph. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's a very big one in Portland, Oregon that I just practically lived in sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> there's all sorts yeah. of, also there's the Weird Stuff Warehouse and the um, the other surplus stores down in the valley Yep. Um, that are sometimes full of tremendous amounts of large amounts of interesting things for very cheap. Definitely. <laughs> so, and always yeah. keep an eye out for, thing, for stores that are closing because they'll have some stuff that they'll want to oh, give away yeah. or sell for really cheap too. And here we start the slippery slope of <laughs> gathering and <laughs> Gathering <saving>. supplies. <laughs> so so yeah, that actually, yeah, that actually yeah. leads to a really good question, um, which is how do you organize supplies in a way that makes a lot of sense for uh, what we might be doing? <laughs> Well, I got so much experience with being unorganized. I think that's a good place to start with, and I won't pretend to, to be uh, to have solved this problem. I think it's an ongoing issue for me. But you know, when I first started teaching tinkering after-school workshops, um, gosh, 
15 years ago or so. It was a, you know, this was my idea of organization. It was just stuff thrown on tables, all kind of hodgepodged out. It was really, really quite a mess. And I, I didn't get super, super organized over the years, but I definitely got more organized over the years. This is a more recent, just a couple of years ago, carts before they're being unpacked with materials. And then as they're set out, there's wooden drawers to help segregate things. You can get those very cheaply at um, rebuilding centers and places that recycle um, furniture, that sort of thing. So I actually found the wooden drawers are very aesthetically pleasing. They're large. They can be configured with different dividers. Um, they can be added to very easily. Mm -hmm. They also can be built upon. They became um, doll houses and stages and um, boxes for things and bases for robots. And uh, they are themselves useful for stacking. Um, they kind of have that cool little art, artisan vibe about them. Definitely. Um, and then you just want to have a good cart. It's really nice to have if you have that. Um, boxes that are uniform. I built a mobile tinkering station that is um, really, this is about $70, um, all two by four dimensions mostly, um, that, with a slide out drawer built on a ladder. So this is a surplus ladder. So this was a way for me to organize things and take them out very quickly between classes and have tools and I could reconfigure. But it also ended up being, a, it's a bike trailer as well. So this is what I take to Maker Fairs, to go to the East Bay, for example. And this is the Portland Mini Maker Fair, where it was supporting just simple paper and tape and uh, compressed air launchers. So it was a way of segregating a certain subset of materials yeah. in a space that I could pull out very quickly. So it's sort of a go-to box yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Um, you might want to consider that rapid deployment. You don't have to have all of your things available for everything. Mm -mm, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and Steve, if you're working on a smaller scale too, just a corner of your house or garage or space, whatever it might look like, to have some boxes and bins available. And you can always engage the youth and the kids in helping you organize. Um, that's a great way to get started so that they know where to go and what they're doing as well and making sure that they have the right supplies and enough of them for sure. Yeah, back to the um, not having everything available all the time. In fact, often having just a few things is more inspiring, just because when, yes. when you're using within, you're working within a few constraints. And then if someone's desperate for something, like why don't I have any wheels? Oh, there's actually a story around that where <laughs> <laughs> um, they say, why don't I have any wheels? And you can say, like, oh, there are lots of ways you can make wheels besides besides using wheels. And I had a um, a colleague, Diane Willow, who always hid all of the Lego wheels um, whenever she was building with Lego with yes. kids at the children's <laughs> museum. Um, then they would have to use all sorts of other things, whether it be gears or like actually reinventing the wheel, right, with yeah. um, yes. different, different ways of doing it. So um, that was really great. Um, another thing that I liked um, when uh, I worked at the MIT Media Lab, we had, um, it was the Lego Lab, and so all of our Lego were in these um, these plastic bins, which are very expensive. So I've been trying to recreate it with different ways of like, you know, whether it's peanut butter jars, which sort of uh, faces your own um, allergy thing. So I've been saving up clear jars where you can see some of the small things as sort of a, almost like wallpaper Mm -hmm. on, um, on on the surfaces of your workspace. So you can scan and, and look for the thing that you want, which you might not have the word for, right? Um, right. Because sometimes you're using something that's not yeah. good, um, to be used in that way. Um, uh, what was I going to say about that, though? Um, yeah, so uh, having having those drawers were really cool because, you know, you don't want them just stuck it out, but um, these were ones that you could actually remove as well, so you could take three things off to a table somewhere, which is really nice. So, like, if you have drawers, make sure that there's something that can be pulled out and then, like, serve as the container that's organizing it on a tabletop. Um, I've seen in a couple of spaces, too, where they use non-clear things, um, so crates and so forth, when they have a lot of, um, a lot of backup materials. Um, Joe, uh, who does these really cool reused um, uh, piano piece sculptures? Um, he takes apart the pianos and then he puts all of all of that kind of piece into these wooden crates and then puts one of them on the front. And so, mm -hmm. like, it's not a transparent surface, but he can scan his um, his room to find that, and he doesn't need to use words then. So you can imagine, like, putting putting the plastic lids on the front of this and then, you know, the little containers on the front of this. If you, if you don't have money even for the wooden drawers that Steve says, they're just 70 bucks or so, you can use a set of um, cardboard boxes again. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Um, I save up all my Amazon boxes because they are they are designed to um, very uh, very efficiently use the space within a UPS truck, so that some of them are twice as long as these other ones. So they actually they're units of each other, up. right? They're like Definitely. blocks, they're like building blocks. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. Those are all really good That's points. That's a good point. Yeah. And I think the visual thing that you mentioned, Michelle, is really important too. I mean, if they are non-clear boxes, it's totally okay, but oftentimes the visual element of being able to see supplies can spark and inspire some new ideas or projects that might not have if you didn't necessarily see them out there. So yeah. that's a really good point. It's, yeah. it's the This kind of brings up the, the topic of presentation and environment. Um, you know, you can take some pains to kind of set things out um, in kind of a nice sense. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in some of my camps where I've gone so far as to have flowers and vases among these pieces right here, and, and people come in, they feel like they're entering some sort of art studio with all these different collage type components or parts that, you know, you never know what's going to happen with these little components, what will be invented, but they've been invited to find materials and make an umbrella hat or whatever it comes out to. Um, so it's, it's how you kind of set things out that makes them inviting, uh, that makes a big difference as far as uh, um, not just what you have. Um, you can make it look really, really good. Yeah, absolutely. And something, we did a workshop with Jay Silver um, a month or two ago, and something that he always uh, recommends is to actually um, identify what those materials are, too, so that um, there is attention put towards each so that everyone recognizes what's available. Um, so that's an aspect that you might consider as well, is to go through and say, here's some straws, here's some yarn, this is a two by four, yeah. here, these are the tools available for your use as well. One thing I can't emphasize enough about space as well is it's all nice and good to have everything laid out, but that takes a lot of space. Mm -hmm. um, you want to emphasize having large blank spaces. This mm -hmm. is sort of making canvas. If they feel cramped and they you know, they want to have a space they can fill up. Um, so make sure that there's a large table with not much on it mm -hmm. um, that invite that they feel like they can go to. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good point. So we've been talking a lot about consumables, which is great because I think those are often what are most accessible and also will get used up. Um, but another good question that comes up a lot is what are some good tools to get started with? Um, and those, hopefully, are more non-consumable things that you won't need to buy and refill and replenish over and over again. So I don't know if either of you have any favorite tools or good tools to start with. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. What's your favorite tool? I was, just, I was just saying, I see some behind you there. Yeah, <laughs> there are some good tools out These here. These are all my tools. So the known thing about working with kids is you've got an excuse not just to buy any tool, but multiples of them. So, <laughs> so, so the tools you see behind here, are, I have many copies of each of them because you, know, you want kids to not be constrained by this bottleneck of this tool. But, um, the simplest tools, though, I think just as a general category, you, you needn't have the most expensive kinds because this is actually one of my favorite tools right here, um, a T-handled reamer. This takes holes, particularly in wood and, and plastic especially, and makes them larger. Mm. There's just so many times when a hole is not quite the right <laughs> size. And you can take it with a few turns of this like this uh, serrated kind of conical edge and make a hole slightly larger. Totally. And then, boom, frustration over until you go too far. But, <laughs> but then, of course, because you're working with things like plastic bottle caps and everything, then you can just start over again. But yeah. that's a favorite tool of mine. Awesome. Similarly, I really like screwdrivers. I have to say they're pretty phenomenal. You can poke, you can stab gently, um, you can use it as a lever. Um, they unscrew and screw and tap, and you can use the back end and the front end, and they're pretty phenomenal across the board. Good screwdrivers are worth investing in. Yeah. Um, bad screwdrivers can be flat out dangerous. This goes for tools in general. Uh, this is not a time for every tool, especially the hand tools that require torque and mm. repeated use. Yeah. It's not a time to skimp at Harbor Freight. Um, you can get good Taiwan level tools oftentimes on sale. You gotta kind of stock them. And everything that I've gotten here is a stocked sale, whether it's been Amazon or Sears or those places. Mm -hmm. um, certain threshold of quality. There are some occasional use tools that you can do just fine that are really cheap. Yeah. But you don't want to skimp on the, the screwdrivers. They've, I've had them break when yeah. they've been really expensive, and that's dangerous. Craftsmen will, uh, they have a lifetime guarantee. Oh. I've, I've, uh, you, I've uh, used them up on that before, so. <laughs> Michelle, what about you? 
Um, well, I'm a big fan of glue guns and scissors and exacto knives because awesome. that's what I grew up using. So um, I, I've found a lot of different ways to use them and um, to use them well. So and I misused them <laughs> as well as uh, I often use exacto knife as a thing to turn things, which you shouldn't do. So. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Children are responsible enough to use X-Acto knives. They, you give them far more credit than, especially if you, you talk about it first. Yes. You set the established rules. And, of course, when you're establishing safety, which has to be talked about anytime you talk to school, um, when you really take time to talk about what this thing could do to you, um, ask the kids that, they will actually come up with rules that are stricter than you might use mm -hmm. and follow them because they're their, their rules. Yeah, um, but I've actually often had children use... Um, Exacto knives in particular in within our school settings that I taught in and uh, after school settings and uh, they've used them extremely responsible, responsibly. Absolutely. Um, likewise, power been, tools. Yeah. I've been wondering about glue guns because that is a very popular tool out there um, that a lot of our kids use. Um, I was using it the other day and I, this is just melted plastic. That's probably not very good for all of us to be uh, breathing. Ventilation is extremely important and then also one thing that will help make glue guns safer because, yeah. because yeah, I had this naive idea that in my last tinkering camp that I would have no glue guns. <laughs> they were going to screw things together, they were going to tape things and, and it lasted one day because it just wasn't time frame wise feasible for what they wanted to build. Yeah. So we really talked about the use of glue guns and how fast you can go through them. You, kids will use about 10 times as much as they actually need. So we, mm -hmm. we practiced using the tiniest amount mm -hmm. just now to get things together. There were less burns, mm -hmm. less fumes, yeah. and of course for me I didn't have to spend 5-10 bucks a day on, on, on glue guns glue sticks, or glue yeah. sticks, exactly. Yeah. So it's the amount, it's training and knowing you don't have to overdo it and goop things together because it's fun to melt things. <laughs> It is always fun, it to, is melt fun to melt things. That's I mean, you got, part of the reason they use so much of it is just the, the power of melting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like lava. Glue guns are like the closest thing to hot lava in your hand That's that you can true. get, except for glass. It's glass. Yeah. That's a whole different story. <laughs> and I, like, um, um, I like introducing, using glue guns as a way to introduce kids to the idea of 3D printing because a lot of 3D yep. printers use the same model but on a much smaller mm. scale. And so yeah. You know, having them build things with the, the glue. That's um, nice. Great. The additive versus subtractive. You know. Yeah, very yeah. much so. Getting back to the power tools here, um, the jigsaw is really nice because you can use it to cut straight lines. It can cut curves. It's rather robust, um, unlike a uh, scroll saw, which you can break the blades very easily. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a little harder to break a jigsaw blade, and you can have it control its throw so it doesn't have so much of an exposed um, cutting surface. Um, Nothing empowers like a sawzall. <laughs> As my kids in Tinkering Sam said, it's not a saw sum, it's a sawzall. <laughs> and uh, that's that's neat because you, you can cut through metal with that puppy and then uh, yeah. yeah. So responsibly used, um, you can have your hands on tools like that with the kid um, to help guide them with it, but they will feel like the most powerful person in the world for that moment. You're empowering them with this, this scary thing that can cut metal pieces in half. So. Similarly with power drills, they're fantastic and I think it's really important to learn and practice how to use a power drill um, because there is a lot of skill that's developed the more and more that you use it and comfort for sure. The other part of it though is if you're not quite ready for a power drill, a hand crank drill is just as good and cuts through wood and cuts through pl uh, paper and plastic just as well and that often helps with the hand-eye coordination and the manipulation of just getting started and getting comfortable with using tools in general. These are everywhere in antique stores and thrift stores and oftentimes I get them for about five bucks a piece and I love them because they're so visceral. You get a kid on this and, and they're going, you know, they're understanding and they're controlling the whole process mm -hmm. and it's a much more satisfying thing to make a hole in this way and try to figure out this coordination than as powerful as this can be. Yeah. Um, yeah. These I don't recommend as heavily because they're oftentimes very awkward. They they're they're harder. They work better on a little plastic, but mm -hmm. but they're they're still really cool too. Um, I just I'm a big fan of these guys. We worked with um, a teacher last year who uh, one of the projects that she had her students do and her high school students in particular was to make a kind of a. Um, 
sculpture and contraption out of driftwood, which was super cool because that speaks to her their native area of San Francisco and the coastline. Um, but realize that the power drill was really intimidating and a little scary, and especially for driftwood that is not perfectly shaped and doesn't lay flat, um, a really good way to start is with the hand crank. Um, and you can, you know, those are good examples, and you can also buy hand cranks on Amazon, the local hardware store, like Fiskars, I think, is a good brand, and they're not expensive at all. If you do need to go the power drill route, though, this is an adult size guy, and there's a whole area of tools right now that are about the size of this without the battery. Mm -hmm. um, compact tools, very powerful, usually around 12 volts. Mm -hmm. uh, Makita makes a good set. Yeah. So does um, Milwaukee. DeWalt. So does Bosch. DeWalt. There's a whole micro compact size. They end up being the perfect ones for kids. Yeah. They're just amazing. They um, work across the board for any any range, but kids too. And you'll sure. th it's a it's a great investment because you'll find you'll use it around the house much yeah. more than you you'll need your full size guy for a lot of stuff. Yeah, so. absolutely. So, Sue, so can um, you more explicitly are you recommending the cord cordless ones then, or because as you were talking, yes. about, the cordless I, ones are. I mean. A cord presents a problem, but it's also lightweight for A small cord things. has a lot of power. It's hard to control, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's just too much. I and agree. also, also the cord itself is a hazard. Yeah. It's one extra factor to worry about. It's one extra less lack of control. I never, ever use a, a, a corded drill. I, I'll sometimes use a corded drill for specific things if you know you really, yeah. if it's, you know, if you're using a spade bit or something and you can keep it in one spot, that might be a good place to start. Yeah. Um, or if there, if people, if, whether you're working with kids or adults, are going to rotate through stations, that might work really well where yeah. you can kind of keep the cord away. But cordless is really great. It's just far safer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, sometimes you might need a, a corded drill for some special jobs. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. possible. Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of go ahead. So one power tool that you didn't mention is the sewing machine. So yeah, I was just gonna mention that. <laughs> so the sewing machine and soldering irons are also phenomenal investments and really wonderful ways to um, try out work with new materials, um, and they can be relatively cheap as well. Um, sewing machines, I think, have come down pretty dramatically. That specific one that Steve showed, I think, is like $85 on Amazon. And you can always borrow, too. So a lot of people ask us, where do you get tools if we don't want to buy them or they're too expensive? And that's a totally valid point. So feel free to borrow. Um, your neighbors and your family members might have spare tools around. People often have 20 some odd screwdrivers lying around, or their junk drawer is a perfect place to look. Um, a lot of neighborhoods and schools have gotten involved in tool drives. So ask your neighbors and parents and family members to contribute one tool, whether it's a consumable or non-consumable, and that's a really great way to start up your um, your stash. A couple more tool shout outs, because this is yeah. a fun show and tell kind of thing. Um, for safety purposes and for lack of frustration purposes, you can never really have enough clamps of yeah. different kinds. Um, you really want to secure pieces that are being sawed, pieces that are being drilled. Mm -hmm. um, so you can have mini ones, you can have maxi ones, you can have C-clamps, you can have all sorts of stuff. But getting things held together very well not, not only reduces frustration in putting things together, it's much safer than rather than having a piece come fly loose around. and fly around. Um, you can actually get really inexpensive drills like this about for about 20 bucks, and they're useful for maybe plastic. Mm -hmm. um, I actually use these whenever I go um, when kids are wanting to modify Lego. Ah, interesting. So I'm not Very a purist cool. when it comes to that. If they, <laughs> if they really, if they really need a hole where it isn't, um, it's it's okay. We'll do it. <laughs> so, yeah, and then of course electrically, I love things like this. The uh, um, these are wire strippers. The little mouths. They look like. Actually, at the Exploratorium, they decorate these with little eyes on them, little googly eyes. Awesome. So they're they become these little characters that are used, which is quite nice. And I have to give a shout out for one of my favorite tools, which is the powered scissors that you saw mm -hmm. um, actually earlier of a two-year-old using very effectively and very safely. Um, he was insistent that he would do it by himself. But this allows you to make cuts in cardboard in curves like butter. That's great. And for a child, that's so empowering and so much safer than some of the other methods. Uh, you know, there's plenty of the, the, the plastic saws that you can kind of cut things mm -hmm. with. But it takes forever. It takes um, it's not a bad way to kind of earn your cuts and your curves, but if you want to remove that barrier and allow for cuts to happen rapidly, the battery life is not good on these. These particular models are discontinued. Most of the ones you'll see in stores now are a circular cutter, mm. and they're better for straight lines. 
But these are still around. If you can find them, they have tiny little snips that um, cut repeatedly, and they are great for really tight curves and cardboard. That's awesome. That's so. a great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, so headed back to where you can find these, especially if they're maybe out of your budget range or you want something specifically, but maybe for a short amount of time. Borrowing them is always a great way to start. Um, in in the East Bay, at least, both the Berkeley and Oakland libraries have tool lending libraries, which I think is still relatively rare, but hopefully will be spreading in popularity soon. And they work just like any library. You go in and borrow it for free, and there's a certain period of time in which you can borrow it, and you take it home with you. And so um, a lot, I know a lot of communities have started that kind of on their own. Um, maybe a local person's garage is, is a library of sorts, so that's something you can look into as well. And I, I think a lot of hardware stores will, will actually let you rent them for mm -hmm. not very much money. And yeah. you could look out um, a very low cost rent, let's say, um, from them as well. Awesome. That's a really good point, yeah. Any other favorite last tools? Well, it's a, it's a last material. It's but, a last material. But, awesome. but asking, your... asking for favorite tools and materials is always a good question to ask um, if you have a celebrity maker coming to visit your club. Yes, yes definitely. It's also a nice thing to ask the kids. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. What do you want more of to make with? What mm -hmm. do you enjoy? Mm -hmm. And again, sometimes it's something they have around. Um, you know, to, to revisit something that's still near and dear to my heart, I mean, the... Many people have Lego and construction sets around. I'm developing um, continually with my tinkering students and myself uh, this area of Lego mechatronics, mm -hmm. of, of taking the Legos that you have, or excuse me, Lego that you have, and um, including very inexpensive motors and wires and batteries and nothing more. It's not Mindstorms. It's not Technic. It is using... Um, these guys have built little cars that roll on the ground out of about a dollar worth of electronic materials and maybe two dollars worth of Lego. Mm -hmm. um, likewise, um, there's all sorts of stuff you can do with connects when you make electromechanic connects things. These are particularly art bots in, that are made entirely of connects that can, and rubber bands. So it's reusable, it's mm -hmm. sustainable, it's what you might already have around. It's just used in new ways by inviting the inclusion of new materials, Absolutely. which can include LEDs as well. In the dark, it's spectacular when you put LEDs on top of any sort of Thing that makes art. And you can Actually, always your mention, your mention of Lego and Connects. I don't know if Connects has something similar, but my my literally favorite tool is Lego has a taking apart tool. Yes, the brick apart. separator. Yeah, that's the brick separator. Um, yeah. It protects your Lego from tooth marks, and you need to tell your kids not to use their teeth on your Lego pieces. Um, oh, that's a I actually heard, like, my kid went to a Lego class, and, like, that was the first thing he said, no teeth on my Lego pieces. <laughs> no. no teeth for stripping wires either. I'm, I'm afraid true. I've used them many times. I used to work um, in high school. I did, I only, I not only acted on stage, I also did some backstage stuff, and more than a few occasions, something had to be stripped or fixed really quickly, really quick. and I would just... You'll nick the... <laughs> don't do it. That's another one of those things we all have, like, you don't want your kids to know you did it when you were a kid. Yeah, but you did. <laughs> but, but you did. And you learned. <laughs> or um, I should say we're still kids. We also used all those junk credit cards for taking our, our pieces apart when the bricks awesome. separated went work. You know, the ones that you get as junk mail. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good thing, too. Absolutely. This is a fun, nerdy thing I've been doing with Lego that um, you might have fun doing with the kids is uh, just the idea of making lamps uh, out of simple pieces. There are mainly two kinds of pieces that make up this lamp right here. There's a third and a fourth right here, but then you put a little LED in there and you've got a little little desk lamp type thing. Um, you can make infinite variations of every kind of design of this sort of thing. Um, they can be made entirely with blocks or whatever, but um, I like the idea of seeing what's possible with a very limited kind of Lego in large amount of quantity. Yeah, absolutely. So. And if you don't have Legos or Connect pieces, that's totally okay too. You can build just as amazing structures and learn a yeah, lot absolutely. with spaghetti. Yes. Raw spaghetti. Raw spaghetti. <laughs> um, and marshmallows. Yeah. Or, and the uh, inside corrugation of cardboard makes an excellent yeah. edge for it. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot. You can roll up newspaper and it becomes a pretty sturdy structure. Masking tape is a wonderful way to create joints and put things together, yeah. as well as yeah. marshmallows, gumdrops, and of course, popsicle sticks, and even wooden coffee stirrers or straws are really nice uh, ways I'm, to do things. I'm too. playing around with straws right now. I'm real excited because um, straws are really darn cool 
in that they can make big structures inexpensively that can be taken apart and reused really quickly. And let me see if I get this right here. I'm building little junctions oh, wow. right here just by twisting LEDs together. And this looks really cool in the dark because you get these whole things right here. Yeah, sure. So you and can that have, might be ten cents worth of supplies. Exactly, right there. but yeah. um, so I'm actually prototyping these to, to present as a, uh, a building provocation for professional development that we're working on. So everybody gets a whole bunch of straws and these little junctions here to build large structures out of that will glow and will turn the lights off in the room and everything here. But um, you know, glowing is, things are always a good good way to start. It's probably worth saying that you can get um, your LEDs really cheap. I usually buy them in grab bags, um, which are like fifty bucks, but you get about a thousand of them. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. That's a really good point, Michelle. Yeah, so I mean, going to your local electronics store, you can buy them yeah. individually, but they tend to be expensive. So yeah. if you know... Don't, don't be fooled by Radio Shack, for example. <laughs> yeah. If you know, but the Radio Shack is convenient and it is in a lot of different places. But if you know that you're going to be using a lot of them or you go in with a couple of other people to invest in a large grab bag or a larger quantity, you can get, in, get them cheaply more on an individual unit basis. Um, similarly, with these coin cell batteries, if you go to like the local Target or Walmart, they tend to be really expensive, but you can buy them in bulk, and they tend to be a lot cheaper. eBay. Um, and eBay, absolutely. Batteries and butter, Amazon. Yeah. yeah. The, um, the nice thing about the grab bags, so um, when you get those, they're not, they're not consistent. You can get, like, it's just the stuff a friend of mine once said, it's like they just sort of swept the floor. Um, at the manufacturer and stuffed it in a bag. And so you get some really odd ones in there, and it's a great learning opportunity then to like have the kids play with them. Sometimes they are bi-directional, um, and you can introduce a lot of things that you might not have otherwise bought. Um, there, you know, and then there's some that have three legs or five legs, and you have to talk about, like, why is it designed like this? Because you would not have otherwise bought that. That's awesome. That's a really good point. You know, and I have to give a shout out for uh, traditional art materials. Yep. Paint. Paint markers. Paint markers. Construction paper. Glitter glue. glue. Glitter. <laughs> pipe cleaners are amazing. Yeah. You know, I mean, these are the time tested. There's nothing broke with them, and nope. they fit in with everything that we've talked about here. They just mix and mash with everything so well. Absolutely. Um, Don't discount those at all. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, uh, they're. Even the little pom poms. Pom poms and foam pieces. <laughs> foam is fantastic. Any sort of foam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they. Um, yeah, and then on the other end of things, um, Makey Makey is a great introduction to um, get kids to be thinking about going from the virtual world into the physical world. It was yes. designed with that in mind, and so it's a, um, a really great way. We've had um, teachers that we work with um, trying to challenge to find good introductory projects. Um, to get their kids excited to use Arduino, and you know, Arduino is a completely different kind of thing in Raspberry Pi, but but that gateway drug is something like the Makey Makey. You can use it with like a three or four year old, and they get it right away. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. Makey Makeys are fantastic, and there are a lot of other. Um, maybe more advanced, you might be able to call them more advanced tools that we can segue into in another session, um, but this one in particular is talking about just really easy things to get started with. Yeah, like fire. Like fire. <laughs> <laughs> Preschoolers and torches. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Well, I think we covered our main questions for today. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Michelle. This is Michelle. always a fun thing to talk about. Yeah. And, I learned about a little more stuff, too. Actually, I'm stoked to build something right now. <laughs> that's, that's the best sign of any conversation, right? How motivated to make are you? Um, and uh, I'm so, you know, those of you that are out there that are working in the Young Makers capacity, um, the kids will know when you're excited about this. I was mm -hmm. speaking earlier. You set the tone for how excited you are about particular materials and tools. Um, Kids will pay attention if you hold a tool in a very special way and kind of revere it like as a sacred or and potentially dangerous thing. They, they catch on to that. Yeah. If you use it cavalierly, then they're going to use it themselves cavalierly. So you are the model for this. Likewise, if you're stoked about having a whole entire table full of nothing but spaghetti... And marshmallows. They're going to be really excited too. So um, I don't think that's going to be a problem though because of the kind of people that are attracted to the young makers. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, let your young makers um, drive a lot of what they're interested in doing too and allow them yeah. to play. And that's don't forget really to play point. and build yourself. Absolutely. It's yeah. the best possible monitoring. It also helps you step back and become a part of the process rather than the, the, you know, the overhead. The over. <laughs> the overlord. <laughs> man upstairs. <laughs> so good. 
<laughs> okay. Great. Thank you, right. everyone. We should do this again. Thank you, guys. Yeah. This is fun. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye, all.